Let's talk about the Christoffel symbols, also known as the Christoffel symbols. We'll start by recalling the previous video where we found this equation to transform the partial derivative of a contravariant tensor component with respect to a coordinate from the unbarred coordinate system x super i to the barred coordinate system x super i bar. Now as we discussed in the last video, this equation unfortunately does not represent a transformation law, so even though t itself is a tensor, a contravariant tensor for that matter, the partial derivative is not a tensor because it does not transform like a tensor per this equation. And the reason behind this is this mixed partial derivative term. I showed you in the last video that if this mixed partial derivative was zero, that is if we had an affine or linear coordinate transformation, then the tensor component's partial derivative would transform like a tensor, a mixed tensor of contravariant rank one and covariant rank one to be specific. And because this mixed second partial term throws such a huge wrench into establishing a tensor transformation law for the derivative of a tensor, we need some quantity to capture this term and find some quantity involving the tensor component partial derivative that does transform like a tensor. And to establish that quantity, we need to talk about the Christoffel symbols, or as I mentioned earlier, the Christoffel symbols. I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about the Christoffel symbols, and a couple videos from now, I'm actually going to try to reconcile this issue with taking the simple partial derivative of a tensor using the Christoffel symbols. I'm going to create something called the covariant derivative with the Christoffel symbols, the idea here will be that even though the simple partial derivative of a tensor doesn't transform like a tensor, it's not a tensor, the covariant derivative of a tensor, which will include the Christoffel symbols, will transform like a tensor. It will be a tensor. Now, there's two kinds of Christoffel symbols, which are pretty aptly named. The first is the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, and the second is the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. The first kind is denoted by gamma with three subscripts i, j, and k, while the second kind is denoted by a gamma with a single superscript i and two subscripts j and k. We'll start by talking about the Christoffel symbols of the first kind. The second kind symbols are probably a bit more important because of their more widespread applicability, but the first kind symbols are also pretty important. So the Christoffel symbol of the first kind is defined as follows, by taking various partial derivatives of the metric tensor with respect to different coordinates in our unbarred coordinate system. I'll call this equation 1. This first kind Christoffel symbol you'll see has some obvious properties. The first is that it's symmetric in the first two indices, so if I switch the indices i and j to make a Christoffel symbol gamma sub j i k, the value of that first kind Christoffel symbol doesn't change. It's the exact same as that of gamma sub i, j, k. You can go on the side and easily demonstrate this property. You know what the first kind Christoffel symbol is with the index order i, j, k. It's just the definition we put up here. By this definition, the first kind Christoffel symbol with the index order j, i, k is the following. And all we've done here is switch the j and the i on the right hand side. Now, if you recall a previous video on the properties of the metric tensor, you'll remember that the metric tensor is a symmetric tensor, meaning that the component g sub i j equals the component g sub j i. We can apply this logic to switch some of the indices in the right-hand side of the second equation to get the following. And this is the exact same equation as the equation for the first kind Christoffel symbol with the index order i j k, just with the first two terms that are being added switched around. But since addition is commutative, that doesn't make a difference. So we've shown that the Christoffel symbol of the first kind is symmetric with respect to the first two indices. The second property we're going to go over is that if and only if the metric tensor components are all constants, then the Christoffel symbols of the first kind are all zero. The first part of proving this property is the proof that if the metric tensor components are constant, then the first kind Christoffel symbol is zero. We'll prove the converse in the second part of this proof. Now this first part is a pretty trivial proof. Since the metric tensor components are all constants, the first kind Christoffel symbol whose equation contains the derivatives of these metric tensor components, that equation becomes zero because the derivative of a constant is just zero. The second part of proving this property is that if the first kind Christoffel symbols are all zero, then the metric tensor components are constant. The way to prove this is to set up the equation for the first kind Christoffel symbol with the index order j, k, i, which would look like this by definition. Now if we add the equations for the first kind Christoffel symbol with the index order i, j, k, 
and the symbol with the index order jki, you just end up with the partial with respect to x super j of g sub ki, since the other terms cancel by getting subtracted out. So if the first kind Christoffel symbols are all zero, that means these two first kind Christoffel symbols on the left must both be zero, which means that then the derivative of the metric tensor component g sub ki with respect to the coordinate x super j is zero. And so if we integrate both sides, we effectively find that the metric tensor components g sub ki are constant. And since the g sub ki components are operationally no different than the g sub ij components, they ultimately represent all the same components of the same metric tensor, we have essentially proven the second part of property 2, and therefore property 2, the if and only if statement, is correct. So these are some properties of the Christoffel symbols of the first kind. Let's now talk about the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. By definition, the Christoffel symbols of the second kind are very closely related to the Christoffel symbols of the first kind. Specifically, my second kind symbols denoted by gamma super i sub jk equals the inner product of the metric tensor, this time in contravariant form, and the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. Now since r is repeated twice on the right hand side, it gets summed over from 1 to n, where n is the dimension of the n-dimensional space in which we have our coordinate system. I'm going to call this definition of the second kind Christoffel symbol equation 2. Now note that the g super ir here represents the contravariant version of the metric tensor, or the inverse metric tensor as we discussed in a previous video. Now just like the Christoffel symbols of the first kind, the second kind symbol also has some neat properties, which are very similar in nature. The first is that the Christoffel symbols of the second kind are symmetric, but this time in the lower two indices, so the j and the k can be interchanged, and it wouldn't change the value of your Christoffel symbol. This is actually pretty easy to prove, because by definition, the second kind Christoffel symbol with the sub-indices j and k is the following, while the second kind Christoffel symbol with the sub-indices k and j is the following. Now since the Christoffel symbol of the first kind is symmetric in the first two sub-indices as we proved earlier, we can conclude that both the left-hand side of the symmetry equation and the right-hand side are equal, so therefore the Christoffel symbol of the second kind is symmetric in its two sub-indices. The second property of the second kind Christoffel symbol is that the symbol vanishes if and only if the metric tensor components are constant. This should make sense because the Christoffel symbol of the second kind is directly related to the Christoffel symbol of the first kind by definition. Then if the Christoffel symbol of the first kind vanishes, the Christoffel symbol of the second kind should also vanish. By a similar logic, the converse statement also holds true. If the Christoffel symbol of the second kind vanishes, then the metric tensor components must all be constants, just like it was with the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. So now we've defined the two kinds of Christoffel symbol and discussed some of their properties. I'm going to end this video by showing you some examples of Christoffel symbols for a common metric tensor. We'll calculate the Christoffel symbols for the metric tensor in two-dimensional polar coordinates. Recall that the metric tensor in two-dimensional polar coordinates is given by the following, where the coordinate x super 1 is basically the distance from the origin, the r, and the x super 2 is the angle from the positive x-axis, the angle theta that you're used to. You can easily derive this metric tensor by finding the distance element ds in polar coordinates, I showed this in a previous video. And because this is the regular metric tensor in polar coordinates, and because it only has diagonal elements, we can easily find the inverse metric tensor, which has contravariant components this time, just by taking the reciprocal of each of the original metric tensor's diagonal terms. So instead, now you have 1 and 1 over x super 1 whole squared. So now that we have the metric tensor and its inverse counterpart, let's go ahead and find the Christoffel symbols. Recall that the symbols of the first kind are given by the following formula, and the symbols of the second kind by this formula, this time with the inverse metric tensor component out front. Now since we're dealing with two-dimensional space, that means i, j, and k each vary from 1 to 2, and since there's two possible values for each index, that means there will be 2 times 2 times 2, so 8 Christoffel symbols of the first kind in two dimensions, and 8 Christoffel symbols of the second kind. So let's find each of those eight Christoffel symbols. It's pretty simple for 1, 1, 1. The first kind symbol will just be based on the derivatives of the constant 1, which is the 1, 1 component of our metric tensor. And since these derivatives will just be 0, the Christoffel symbol of the first kind will be 0. 
You can also show that the Christoffel symbol of the second kind with indices 1, 1, 1 will also be 0 by definition and by calculation. Now for the 2, 2, 2 Christoffel symbol of the first kind, it's a similar idea. The 2, 2 component of the metric tensor is x super 1 whole squared, but when you take its partial derivative with respect to x super 2, you actually end up with 0. And that's why the 2, 2, 2 Christoffel symbol of the first kind is 0. And again, if you calculate the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, 2, 2, 2, then that will also turn out to be 0. The same logic applies if you're looking at the first kind Christoffel symbol with 1 as the value for two of its indices, so that includes gamma sub 2, 1, 1. Let's go through this symbol carefully so I can show you how to calculate it. I'll start by copy-pasting the right-hand side of the definition of the first kind Christoffel symbol, then I'll carefully go through the indices I want to find and substitute them accordingly. So I want my i to be 2, so I'll erase all my i's on the right and replace them by 2. I want my j to be 1, so I'll erase all the j's on the right and make them 1. And I want my k to be 1, so I'll do the same thing for k. And when I do all this, here's what I end up for the equation of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, 2, 1, 1. Now, this Christoffel symbol has either cross terms involved, like the g sub 1, 2 and g sub 2, 1, or you end up taking the derivative of the constant. All in all, it just turns out to be 0. You can also show that the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, the gamma super 2 sub 1, 1, will also be 0. Let's now look at the Christoffel symbols of the first kind, 1, 2, 1 and 1, 1, 2. This time I won't go through these one by one, but you can show that if you apply the definition, then once again, for each of these Christoffel symbols, you've either got a cross term involved, which is obviously zero, or you're taking the derivative of a non-zero metric tensor value with respect to x super 2, which isn't anywhere in the metric tensor to begin with. So in the end, these two Christoffel symbols of the first kind are zero, and then you can also show that the corresponding second kind Christoffel symbols are also zero. Now so far we've shown that 5 out of the possible 8 Christoffel symbols of the first and second kind are 0, but they're not all 0. These last three are going to be our non-zero Christoffel symbols. Let's start with the first kind Christoffel of 2, 1, 2. Again, same formula applies, and since the partial with respect to x super 2 is 0, you're left with the partial of g sub 2, 2, our x super 1 squared, with respect to x super 1, which is just 2 times x super 1. And that means if you take half of that, the first kind Christoffel symbol turns out to be x super 1. The next one we'll look at is the first kind Christoffel symbol of 1, 2, 2, which is actually the exact same as 2, 1, 2 because the first kind Christoffel symbol is symmetric in the first two indices. This is a property we discussed earlier in the video, and because of this, the first kind Christoffel symbol 1, 2, 2 is also x super 1. The corresponding second kind Christoffel symbol super 2 sub 1 2 is as follows. Since r is a dummy index on the right being summed over, and since we're only in two dimensional space, r is just being summed from 1 to 2, so we can expand out the right hand side here as follows. Now since the first kind Christoffel of 1 2 1 is 0, the first term goes away. Meanwhile, the second term, if we plug in the first kind Christoffel of 1 2 2 and g super 2 2, this is what we end up with which then simplifies to 1 over x super 1. And since the second kind Christoffel symbol is symmetric around the bottom two indices, this also makes the second kind Christoffel symbol super 2 and then sub 2 1 the same thing. We're almost done. The last Christoffel symbol of the first kind we need is for 2 2 1. These first two terms cancel, and we're just left with half the negative partial of x super 1 squared, which is just negative x super 1. The last second kind Christoffel symbol is now for 1, 2, 2. It's the same idea as before. If we expand out the right hand side, this is what we get. And if we plug in the relevant values, we end up with negative x super 1 as the value of the second kind Christoffel symbol. So there you have it. You have successfully calculated the eight Christoffel symbols of the first kind for the metric tensor and polar coordinates, and you've successfully done the same for the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. If you wanted to repeat this exercise for a three-dimensional situation, like for a metric tensor and spherical coordinates, you'd have to calculate 3 times 3 times 3, so 27 of each symbol, and so 54 in total if you do both the first and the second kind which is absolute insanity and would take me an entire video. But textbook exercises and problems do expect you to know how, so make sure to put in some practice.
Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. The next video is going to be about the transformation rules for Christoffel symbols, which you'll see will not end up being tensors in the end because they don't exactly follow tensor transformation laws. I'd like to thank the following patrons, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.